Hey there, and welcome to episode two of Flintlock Friday, a show dedicated to you, the viewer, to help you identify these historic rifles and muskets of the Flintlock era, as well as provide you with a concise yet informative overview of the rich history of these historic firearms. I'm your host, Reviewer 311, and let's get started. And on today's episode, we will be looking at the first mass production of muskets from federal arsenals. This is a Harper's Ferry Charleville pattern made in 1811. You may hear these commonly referred to as the Harper's Ferry Model 1795 Type 2. We have to make sure that we distinguish a Harper's Ferry 1795 or Charleville from a Springfield 1795, all the way up to the Type 2 part, actually. Springfield and Harper's Ferry were both the federal arsenals and they were both pumping out thousands of these guns. But while they shared the same root system, they actually had two sort of separate production branches, leaving uh, basically their own unique species of musket, as you will. The Springfield Armory actually produced four different types and Harper's Ferry produced three, giving you a total of seven different Charleville pattern types produced at the federal arsenals. But first, let's look into specifications and the dimensions of this musket. So let's go over this piece, lock, stock, and barrel. First off, we're gonna be looking at this lock plate. As you can see, the lock plate is flat. It has a flat reinforced cock, and I need to make this mention because from my previous episode, episode one, I forgot to mention that the, re uh, the reinforced cock on that French infantry musket is a replacement. It's probably from a 1774, but I have yet to confirm that. When they left the arsenals, it should have had a flat, re uh, a flat reinforced cock with this beveled edges, such as this one. So this is a good example of what that musket should have looked like. It says, Harper's Ferry 1811, the year that it was made. Not the model. That's not quite how that works for this time frame. And as we move forward, we find one of probably the coolest pieces of history about this entire gun. So I was like looking at it, and if you've seen my unboxing, I kind of noticed it. But that eagle is facing the arrows. But why does that matter, Revere? Well, it doesn't, but it is really cool history trivia. And if you're a part, if you love this sort of trivia, you're gonna enjoy this. So the great seal of the United States is the eagle, and in one town it's holding the olive branches, and in one town it's holding arrows, and it's always facing the olive branches. Except for this one. This one is actually facing the arrows. And I actually went back into National Archives because I was like, did they change this seal? President Harry Truman did in the 40s or 50s. But before that, in 1782, I found the, uh, an original child scratch depiction. I don't think a child actually drew it, but it looks like a child drew it. I'm going to post it right here because that is what we were going to go with. And uh, I am glad that we updated from that. So that is one scrawny looking chicken. But as you can notice, that chi uh, that scrawny chicken is actually looking at the olive branches. So I don't know why they chose to have it look towards the arrows for the arsenals, but they did. And it's an urban legend that they have the eagle change its head this way and that if at war or if at peace, the eagle is always facing the olive branches. To the best of my knowledge, if you could provide information that shows me otherwise, I would be happy to look into that. Anyways, as an aside, that's completed. So we got our great seal of the United States right there. As we move forward, we have an integrated iron pan that has a rounded bottom. You have a hammer that is straight and doesn't have a curve at the top. We have our hammer spring, which follows the contours of that lock plate. And you can see as we come back that we have our sling swivel down here on the trigger guard is actually a separate from the trigger guard in your 1777s and your models of 1816. That rear or lower sling swivel is actually built into that trigger guard. The trigger guard has pointy ends on both ends actually. And the Muller book says that the pointy end up here on the top is reminiscent of a 1773. These pointy ends on the bottom are reminiscent of the system of 1763-66. On the flip side, you have a flat side plate held in by two flat head screws. And then you have your final inspector's mark from the superintendent of Harper's Ferry, V for viewed and JS for James Stubblefield. 
You will also see on the lock shadow sometimes here, you will see a V and an MH and a V and an AT. This one does not have that. It could have been rubbed off. Continuing with the stock, we're going to start over here at the butt plate. Is it, it is an iron butt plate held in with two screws, one that is going down vertically and the other one that is going through horizontally. And then as we move forward, you have that comb of the stock. And now we're going to be looking at the barrel. So the barrel is going to be held in by these three barrel bands, as well as one screw that is right here in the barrel tang. The barrel, uh, these barrel bands can actually, if you depress these springs, you can just slide them off. This is so much more preferable to than the English or King's muskets pin style. I don't like them. You know, I don't like them. We're just going to move on. But this allows soldiers in the field to just take a screwdriver. They could take off that single screw holding in the barrel. You could pop off the barrel bands and you can give your entire firearm a good oiling or cleaning as needed. So you have your, your barrel bands right here and then you have your middle one that has your sling swivel. And then you have your top or uppermost barrel band with the brass front sight post. And then you have your bayonet lug on the top. Returning back towards the breech of the barrel is where we will find our markings. We actually have our proof mark there starting closest to the breech. That is an eagle with a P above it. P means the barrel has been put through a stress test and proofed. Um, and that P is facing the lock plate. We then moving forward have our US, which is the government marking, showing that this belongs to the United States government. And then we have something that's very unique to Harper's Ferry Charlottesville. This one has number 2449. So what do you think that stands for? Well, it's a serial number, so number 2449. If you know the answer to this, then you also spend a lot of time reading these books. But that number 2449 does not stand for 2,449, and nor does it stand for 20,449, which is my guess is. It is actually 20, this is musket barrel 25,449. So they made musket barrels zero and about 25,000, which is in 1811, that checks out in the Muller book, they switched over and they make another flight of barrels and they start from zero. So this is made middle of 1811. Needless to say, it's pretty cool that we have that. And in 1812, they stopped adding serial numbers to the barrels. As we continue on with the barrel, it is a 69 caliber. The barrel length is 45 inches, breech to muzzle. And the overall length of the entire firearms is 60 and 1 8 inches. You'll have to convert that to metric on your own time. The weight of the musket is nine pounds, but I do not have a ramrod. Now this is about half, I weighed this to be about half a pound heavier than my French infantry musket, the 1766. But as you can tell, these muskets borrow heavily from the French infantry muskets. And that is going to be the next part of this video. We are going to talk about the history of the Harpers Ferry Charleville. So for the history, why did the Americans choose the 1766 model as their pattern of muskets moving forward? The model 1770 was already out. It had the vast improvements of a detachable pan that was made of a brass type alloy. It was shorter, it was lighter, it was still the same caliber. The original 1777s are highly regarded as probably the best combat musket of the era. So why did the Americans go with the uh, an antiquated uh, 1766 version? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, one is they have a lot of these guns in storage at the end of the American Revolutionary War. Two, they have men that have been working on these guns. And three, they can use the parts from the guns that they have and that working knowledge to already kickstart their ability to get into mass production to produce the nation's first homegrown firearm made at the federal arsenals. We have to always make sure we mention that caveat that these are the first guns made at the federal arsenals. The U.S. government contracted and got guns before that, but anyways, I digress. There's always so much history to go over. Anyways, so they choose the model of 1766 with the 68 uh, editions, which is basically this spring right here in this lower barrel band. And uh, Springfield is the first 
Government Arsenal, Harper's Ferry is the second one, and Harper's Ferry has a very slow start. Actually, it's pretty rough. They only delivered around 3,000 muskets into store um, of the Type 1, and in 18, 1805, they actually produced zero, big old goose eggs amount of muskets. But we also have to remember that at the time, Harper's Ferry is producing out of the rifle factory, the model of 1803s, and they're also producing around uh, 4,200 of the model of 1805 pistols. Harper's Ferry is lagging behind Springfield, and that doesn't that shouldn't surprise you. Springfield traces its origins back to the American Revolutionary War. It wasn't an, a federal arsenal at the time, but it was an armory, and repairs were done in that vicinity, to the best of my knowledge. I'm not in the Springfield. I'm Harper's Ferry guy. Harper's Ferry was actually completely built up and mostly because of George Washington. He wanted it there, so they had to go into basically on the edge of the wilderness to the sleepy little crossing of Harper's Ferry and build the factories. Springfield is outproducing Harper's Ferry. There's no competition, but Harper's Ferry is benefiting a lot from the technological advancements from Springfield. These advancements that Springfield is able to do have to do with the uh, auger for the boring of the barrels, and they also are able to do more with their cast steel. So the superintendent of Harper's Ferry at the time was a man named Joseph Perkin. He had actually worked at refinishing and fixing muskets during the American Revolutionary War in Philadelphia. He was the first superintendent of Harper's Ferry. But as we kind of covered, uh, they're not producing muskets. And this has actually made it all the way up to the Secretary of War, Henry Dearborn, who was actually with Arnold at Quebec and Montgomery, but RIP Montgomery. Bad, wrong place, wrong time. But anyways, fast forward. Henry Dearborn writes a letter to Joseph Perkins. He says, because they're not producing, and this is probably my favorite 18th century version of an email from your boss that, hey, you need to kick it into gear or things are going to happen. He writes in May of 1806, you, Joseph Perkin, require 120 workmen to manufacture 4,000 stands of muskets annually. How could you require 36 more workmen to make 1,000 muskets in one year? And Mr. Prescott of Springfield requires only 17 workmen to manufacture 1,000 muskets in the same time. So he's saying Springfield is actually making more guns with less people in the same amount of time. What is happening? Dearborn actually, and then he goes on to like, I guess because you're writing a letter, so it's not email or text, so you just, you have that time to think through your emotions, and he writes out, but the arms made at Springfield are not quite as nicely finished as, as those made at Harper's Ferry, yet the ones made at Harper's Ferry are generally considered as very excellent and as superior to any European soldier's musket. I mean, there might be a little bit of American bias at that. We always have a, uh, yeah, whatever. Let's say we had the best muskets. I'm going to go with it. Works for me. Remember, the War of 1812 is the Napoleonic Wars DLC version that includes the North American map. Always some good with the bad coming from Henry Dearborn, the Secretary of War, when he's trying to get one of his factories in line. Uh, Joseph Perkin goes ahead and he dies uh, in December of 1806, so unfortunately for him, he was unable to right the ship and fix all the problems that Henry Dearborn had with him. So, with Joseph Perkin out of the way, the government first goes to Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney has, has done some musket contracts for the government by this time. Eli Whitney is... Um, making large advances in technology, especially towards a version of interchangeability of parts, but that's a story for a different time. Anyways, Eli Whitney says, no, I'm not going to go be the superintendent of Harper's Ferry. So in 1807, the job goes to the Virginia gun maker, James Stubblefield. And if you recognize that name, is because I said that name already in this episode. James Stubblefield is the final inspector's mark right here on the shadow of the stock. You can see the view and JS for James Stubblefield. But back to the Charleville muskets. From 1801 to 1807, the first type of Charleville muskets were made at Harper's Ferry. And remember, not a lot of them. In 1808, they more or less, they're coming upon a pattern. Uh, 
had evolved, which served as a model for the award of the 1808 contract. So in 1808, the government sends out to a bunch of contractors to start making muskets. Muskets made at the Harpers Ferry Armory are similar to those produced out of Springfield. In major particulars, there are differences in which Harper's Ferry is using older type parts they presumably just had on hand, and they are available and they put them to use. And you can you can see that in uh, maybe these uh, pointy um, trigger guards over here. Those are going to be replaced, and those harken back to the 1773 or the 1766. So Harper's Ferry is kind of just taking parts and putting it together. That's in general, it's these type systems, since they weren't actually built into the actual production at Harper's Ferry, you're gonna have some overlap in years. So don't freak out if something is from like a type three on a type two, uh, just do a little bit more research by the books. And, uh, but just in general, don't completely freak out, just do a little bit more research. So we get to this, these type twos production begins in 1808 and that lasts until 1813. But by 1813, you're also starting to get a mix of Type 3s. Yes, there is the Type 3, and yes, there will be a Flintlock Friday episode about that. So Type 3s start to come in, and in general, they are going to shorten the barrel, and they're going to change that trigger guard to a rounded edge. Um, but this is a Type 2, and in 1811, they made 9,610 new muskets at Harper's Ferry Arsenal. So that is the general overview of the production of the Harper's Ferry Charleville Type 2, or the one made, I have that was made in 1811. Like I said, these guns would go on to be used in the War of 1812, in the wars of Western expansion, and all the way up into and including the Civil War. You could assume that some would have been used in their flintlock configuration, but there's lots of examples of these smoothbore muskets being converted to percussion and not just these American Charlevilles, but also French infantry muskets and models of 1816. They took any of these that they could and converted them to percussion. But that is a general overall history of it. It was, I, it did, I mean, as far as the military arm, it already had a tried and proven combat record. I mean, there's nothing too much different between this and the musket that the American military had been using since the American Revolution. They knew it, they knew it well, they knew it so well they chose to go with it, and it was America's first mass-produced at a government arsenal flintlock military musket. Now let's go specifically into my musket. So I feel like I have covered a lot of the history, the overview, the markings, the inspector's marks, uh, to give you a very general overview, there's obviously a lot more to go into about these guns, and I'll be making longer form videos in the future. This musket I picked up off an online auction uh, not too long ago, I think three weeks or a couple weeks ago, and I won the auction at $1,700 in total with the buyer's premium, the taxes, and the, I don't know, I had to pay somebody else, and it was $2,337.23. And then I had to pay shipping and handling, which always kind of takes a dig at me recently. And that was $156 for shipping and handling, giving you a grand total of $2,493.23. And I should have just spent $6. And let's do the math. No, oh, no, it's too late. 67 cents, and I could have made $2,500 flat. I am very happy with this musket that I have. It has not been reconverted. It is, it is in its original flintlock configuration. It's got that integrated pan. You can see it. Like It is awesome. The fact that the eagle is facing the arrows is amazing. But yeah, so that is the end of episode two of Flintlock Friday. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. Any comments, leave them down below. And I want to hear um, what is an, an underappreciated flintlock military musket that you can think of off the top of your head. And one that if you could get your hands on it, what would it be? Because there are so many in my mind that I want to get my hands on. But we'll leave that for another day. So thanks for watching. Until next time, have a good one.